Hey beauties, welcome back to Aesthetic Chat with Kiki. I'm your host Kiana Gamble and I'm so excited to announce this next guest. It is Erin Jensen. She is a PA. She owns multiple locations called The Treatment and oh she also has a podcast with her sister. So I'm excited to jump right into our conversation and hope you all enjoy. Thank you, Erin, for coming on Aesthetic Chat with Kiki. I want to start by chatting a little bit about your journey into the aesthetic world. And then I also know that you have your own podcast, so I want you to refer to that podcast episode as well if people want to hear a little bit more about your story. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Erin Jensen. I'm a physician assistant. I've been a PA for 14 years now. I started right out of PA school in dermatology. And when I was in PA school, uh, you know, looking at all the different specialties, I knew that I wanted to do something that was hands-on, that was procedural based. So I didn't know if that was going to be ER or surgery, plastic surgery, women's health, but I knew like that's where I wanted to be. So I actually had all my advanced rotations set up. I went to USC for PA school, set up in plastic surgery, and then I had the opportunity to go to my mom's dermatologist appointment with her. She let me know she was going to get some Botox done at her dermatologist office. And I tacked along to that visit. And I was in there with in the room, the exam room with my mom and uh, the doctor who would soon be my employer. I mentioned, oh, I'm in PA school. I'm really interested in dermatology. She ended up calling me a week later and offered me to do my advanced rotation with her and her husband at her office. And they ended up hiring me right out of PA school. And so I feel very fortunate that I was able to get into, you know, a a pretty um, competitive specialty right out of PA school. So starting back with uh, injectables, you know, 14 years ago, Botox was barely a thing, you know, no one was really doing it. So in the dermatology practice, I probably did 1% Botox, and then the rest medical dermatology, warts, skin cancers, rashes, all that really fun stuff. And just as time went on, I kind of took hold of the aesthetics at the dermatology practice. And I was the main person doing our lasers and injectables and it just, everything kind of progressed from there and we can kind of get into that more, but that's kind of how I got my start in aesthetics, which was, I feel very fortunate to have gotten in early and had this slow progression into aesthetics. It's been, it's been a very fun industry to be a part of. Very cool. So how long were you doing just medical derm before you kind of slowly dipped your toe into aesthetics, especially if even Botox was pretty new, you know? Yeah. So I think right off the bat, um, when at the dermatology practice, it might be 39 patients of medical derm and one patient of Botox. And that was simply because aesthetics just wasn't as big back then. It wasn't an injectable only side of the practice. And just as that kind of repeat customers came along, more indications for treatment areas uh, were out there. There were more marketing opportunities from the drug companies and then it just slowly transitioned. So when I ended up leaving my my dermatology practice, I was probably doing 70% cosmetic and 30% medical derm. You know, I really like it, but it is, it's a little bit of a balance to do both of them because they're different types of clientele. They're different needs or different booking appointments. But from, from the starting off, I mean, I started off doing aesthetics right away. It just wasn't as big as it is today. Gotcha. Do you miss medical derm at all? Just because I know now that you're completely aesthetics. Yeah. Oh, so sometimes I do and sometimes, but most of the time I don't. There are aspects in every specialty that are more appealing than others. I know I really loved any type of procedure with, with dermatology. So removing skin cancers, doing excisions. Um, and the great thing about medical dermatology is that it's such a, once you understand it and get it, it actually comes quite easily. I mean, it's just a type of specialty where you don't even really need a history from the patient. You just look at it, you know it, you know how to treat it. And it's very, very fast paced. I was just saying the other day, what do we, I cut off something off of somebody. That's a very dermatology thing. What was it? <laughs> um, oh, I know. Um, one of our providers had a, um, a larger angioma on her, a cherry angioma on her scalp and we removed it. And, 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 you know, in aesthetics, when you see something that's a little bit different, it was very interesting. Everyone's in there watching it be done and just kind of, you know, someone asked me, do you miss this? And, and I said, yeah, I do. This is fun to do, but everything else that comes all encompassing with medicine in general, I mean, medicine in general is very frustrating just with the setup of insurance companies and how, you know, offices are run. It's just, it's a, 
you're not just navigating the patient interaction, you're navigating so many more things than that. So in that regards, I mean, I don't think I'd ever go back to practicing medical dermatology, but you know, if I could moonlight every once in a while, I think I, I, I would, I would do it. (laughs) Absolutely. I think there's a lot of hurdles with traditional medicine and that's why a lot of people are transitioning away from that, even transitioning away from medicine altogether. So I was doing a little bit of research on you just because you do, you and your sister have a podcast. And I have to say that I, I guess I binge listen to like all of your guys' episodes. <laughs> you and Megan are very entertaining. I, I absolutely loved all the episodes and I was very sad to learn that you guys aren't recording anymore, but. Oh, well, okay. We're, we're semi-retired, but we're like the band that does our farewell well tour and you never know when they're going to come back. Uh, so what, um, so for those of you listening to the, to this podcast right now, I started the treatment skin boutique a little over five years ago and I started it with my sister. My sister has zero experience in medicine. So in the beginning I ran the back of the house, saw patients, did everything in the back. She ran the front of the house. So it was just us two. And we had one esthetician that was working with us. Her, her background's in hospitality. So she's worked for American Express, W Hotel. She's been like an executive assistant to this like very wealthy billionaire personality. Like she's just ran the world. And on top of that, she also has a background in broadcasting. So she's a, like a radio DJ and, and, a, and a whole another DJ life. So I, I kind of twisted her arm like I do in so many things into doing a <laughs> podcast. I mean, a podcast I, podcasting is it's just very interesting. I love it as a medium to get information from and entertainment. She's great at it. She's a great personality. You know, I have this educational background in aesthetics. So it's, I thought it was something that we could do where we could educate our patients, but in a very fun way. I actually just came from a Galderma training right now that I was conducting. And someone who wasn't familiar with the podcast, me and the uh, one of the reps were trying to explain it to her. I was like, it's educational, but raunchy, like raunchy education. Yes, and- absolutely. <laughs> raunchy is a great, a, a great descriptive word, right? Um, yes. So, so, but we have fun with it. You know, if you, if you can learn something, but it has a little entertainment value, a little shock value to it, you know, why not? I mean, maybe it's like 16 and over. You want to listen to it? Not for the, not for the kiddos in the room. Um, but we did, we did record a hundred episodes and we started it right before COVID. I think, I believe it was January, February of 2020. And we didn't miss a week. I mean, maybe like one or two weeks, but we powered through an episode a week. And, you know, as you know, as a podcaster, it, it's, it seems like it might be easy just to record 45 minutes a week, but it, there's way more that goes into um, podcasting. That's why I was so impressed that. One, you guys got to 100 episodes so fast. And two, you guys were almost doing like two episodes a week. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go with like one a month. (laughs) (laughs) That is just fine. But I will say we we had a team, you know, we do, we had a sound engineer that, that recorded for us and edited everything for us. But my sister ran, I mean, she still to this day runs um, the, the Instagram. So it is called Through Thick and Skin, Through Thick and Skin. And you can still find it on all the podcast platforms. Um, but we're still pretty active on that social media channel. It's just a fun way to still give entertaining, educational content. That's that's kind of our goal with it. Um, so if you are looking for, I mean, we've run the gamut on that podcast. So everything from um, informing patients about how different injectable procedures work, but also our personal life, how to become an aesthetic injector, uh, anything you might want to know about our lives, about aesthetics. I mean, we have covered everything and it's in a very, very fun way. So you can still find all those episodes on all your podcast listening um, channels. Yes. And you do a really like very in-depth episode on kind of your story, your journey. And then you do another episode about kind of like PA route or NP route or aren't like all of those different things and kind of why overall you ended up going PA school. So I think that for those listening, I think it's really good resource to tap into. Um, But learning from that podcast episode, I learned that you actually started the derm practice that you had started with was actually the one and only Dr. Pimple Popper on TLC, which I think is fun. She seems like a great person to learn from and a great person to be a colleague with. And um, I just love to hear a little bit more about, you know, your experience in the clinic and just, I guess, day to day with potentially filming. Cause were you there when the show had started? Kind of. So I'll give you kind of my history. So I, so her father is a dermatologist and he was the local dermatologist. Like my parents went to, 
I, as a child, grew up going to, like, he was the dermatologist. So she took over his practice and her husband, who is also a dermatologist, they took over his practice. And so that's who I started working for right out, uh, right out of PA school. And they, what's really, was really great about them is that they, since they were both dermatologists, they both had different strengths. Um, he was very medical focused, a very great educator. She, of course, is a great surgeon and had the aesthetic realm. So I was able to learn from both of them, um, right in the beginning and had this great jump start to just a, a great dermatology background career. So I'm, I'm very, very thankful for that. Um, so I worked there for several years. So I was there, let's see, timeline wise for about five years, just normal dermatology practice. And then she, she, she had an episode on the doctor show and then Buzzfeed featured the Instagram page. And then it kind of went viral from there, like blew up overnight. And so I was there for a few years before the show came about. So I don't think many people realize that. I mean, it before the TV show came out, it was like a social media thing for maybe four or five years. Like it was several years before the TV show came. Oh, okay. So, yes. So there was a lot involved. Around. And then not just the TV show, but she did different TV like spots on the doctor show and like all different kinds of things. So, um, you know, with social media and if anyone's listening, uh, I mean, or if you have a large social media background, social media does bring out patients to come and see you. But it's not, it's, it's, I think it's a different type of patient than what you get from word of mouth referrals from local clientele. Um, Absolutely. There was a a bit more of a pomp and circumstance around those type of patients that would come see us from social media. And it was, it was honestly like a little bit more to handle, you know, a lot of patients came with friends or family and it was kind of like a, uh, gosh, what's the right word? I want to, I don't want sideshows a little bit bold, but it's just like this whole production with like a medical visit where something that was very just a mundane thing we see all the time became into this big, like, you know, what is, and we're like, it's just, it's just an Instagram page, you know, like it's just a dermatology practice. You know, like, what do you have? And so we were like, this is everyday. This is my everyday job. <laughs> it kind of, yes. And yes. And I'm like, what do you, what are you here for? Let me see your cyst. Okay. You're <laughs> Let's move it. Turn it right. Oh <laughs> so, and so, you know, with that, it, it is, it, it, it's, it's a whole thing. And I know there's lots of plastic surgery offices and, uh, and just like social media in general, like it, it just brings this whole level light to the practice. So when the kind of the TV show was in development or the pilot was, it was um, being filmed, I opted to um, stay out of that side of the, the office and the production just because that just really wasn't my passion. It's not where like I was, what I was looking for as far as like a person with my personal life, with my family, my husband, my children. And I just didn't know what was going to come of it. So I opted out of it. So the show was filmed when I was at the practice, but I opted out of being in anything. And then at that time, there was just like a, a little bit of a dynamic shift with the show versus just a kind of homegrown dermatology practice versus the development of the aesthetic world. So I just knew at that time, since all the shifts were happening, just had my third child, not that like soon be- or long before, said I did want to kind of move on and just do aesthetics, injectables only. And that's kind of where I kind of found another physician to partner with and opened the treatment. That's how that was all born. Very cool. So with the treatment, one of my questions for you is, were you kind of making those next steps to transition into your own practice? prior to actually leaving or were you, did you kind of give your notice and then make the steps towards the treatment and all it is today? Envisioning what the treatment is. So right now we have, we're opening our fourth location in April of 2023 and we'll be opening our fifth location in the summer, this summer, 2023. So if you would ask me, you know, 10 years ago, oh, is your vision to have all this multi-office practice? No way. I mean, I told people for years, like, I'm going to die at this dermatology practice. Like, this is what I do. I like it. No, I would never want to do anything like that. So that was, it was never the long-term goal. But when I knew I was just done with that stage of my life, then there was kind of planning and executing behind the scenes while I was still working. So I'm a very like strategic worker bee. And so I just knew how much time it would need to like make the launch, make the announcement. So I gave my notice in November of 2018 and, or no, 2017. Yes, 2017. And then 
I opened in, and I think they had kept me for two more weeks and then I left around Thanksgiving. Then I opened the first week of January. So there was only okay. six weeks between. No, but we would, I'd already identified a spot, um, tenant improvements to the location. It was just that six week gap to kind of get the, uh, everything else in order. Very cool. So you said you're opening locations four and five and you've only been open, first location's only been open going on five years, you'd said? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. So I guess where is this drive and motivation to continue to open the treatments? I think that's really, really cool. Gosh, you know, I, I don't even, I don't even know. I mean, but Anyone who knows me, my brain is working all the time. I have my to-do list. It just is constant. It gets checked off and I add new thing to it. But I really love building systems. I mean, in my personal life, in the business. And I think once you build a system and something runs itself, then you can move on to the next system to build. So who knows? You know, I'm not at a point where I want to slow down. I, I I'm tired. You know, I get tired and I take breaks, but it's just so much fun. And I think I'm very fortunate as being a trainer for Allergan and Galderma. I'm able to travel all across the country and be in all different kinds of medical practices, med spas. And I see what's out there and I just see the need for really advanced aesthetic practices, just where there's this concierge level of service and we're taking everything to the next level. But I think just the world needs it. You know, obviously this is elective, but there's so much room to grow. It's just the infancy of aesthetics. And I just get so excited every day. I love every single one of our employees. We're going on, I think we have about 70 employees now. I know every single one. Oh my one. goodness. Yeah, it's, it's wild. 70? 70. 70. That's, I can, that's yeah, amazing. I can, I can name them all. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I just love it. It's fun. I wake. I get to do something different every day. I see patients two days a week. I do the business stuff, I train. So I think once I get tired or, but also too, the goal is not to have 30 treatment locations. I mean, I don't think so right now, but who, who knows what time will tell. <laughs> but it's not to mass produce it. Like where with the quality is ever um, compromised, that is when we would cut it off. Like we, it has to be the highest level of hospitality service or nothing. I mean, if stuff is not organized and clean and perfect at all times. The level of case, education isn't there for all of our estheticians and injectors and nurses. It just, it, 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 it would stop. And we're at a point where we, we're growing it and we're making things better and better every day. And I think it's just, it's fun. And that's why I think it's so lucky, like, especially in aesthetics, when you can enjoy what you do every day, then you should, we should just be really thankful we're in this career that we, we have. Well, that's amazing. I think it's very impressive too, that you're Located in California. I mean, it's a very saturated market down there. So do you foresee all of the treatment locations staying within California or do you think you'll eventually branch out to other states? That is a great question, Kiki, because our location number five is not in California. I can't quite announce where it is yet, but location five will be outside of California. Okay. That's exciting. Yes. Yes. And California. So yes, California pockets of it are saturated. And I think that's what people underestimate about aesthetics is that aesthetics isn't just for Beverly Hills or New York mm -hmm. City. I mean, we have a location in Newport Beach, but I can tell you our all of our offices are busy, but our, our Newport office is not our busiest office. So there is aesthetics needs are everywhere. And I think that's where you can really excel is that if you find a small community that needs aesthetics and you offer good quality care, there is so much business to go around. I think that's a great philosophy. What is one of the best things about owning an aesthetic practice? And what is one of the things that's, I guess, maybe more of like the uglier side or not as ideal that maybe you really didn't understand or know going into owning your own clinic? Yeah, I think... I think the best thing is this, I can create everything how I want it to be. You know, if I work somewhere else, if you want, I don't know, something as small as like how your drawers are organized, you know, you can't always put what you want in your certain drawers or how the patients are addressed or the time they wait. Like I get, I can, I can kind of control what I want and make sure everything is executed very well. I think the hard thing is just, gosh, business in general, it's, it is 24 seven. And just when you think you have covered all of the issues you could have as an employer, 
you haven't. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it just hiring the right people, retaining the right people. Hire, I think hiring is just the most difficult and California laws are very, very strict. And so we just have to make sure we're following everything appropriately. So it's this fine balance where we want to still have this very close knit, um, I guess, uh, family like environment, but at the same time, you have to follow all the California employment laws. And sometimes that can just feel a little stuffy. So that's, that's kind of a little frustrating sometimes. And yeah, just making sure you hire the right person. I mean, we've gone through owning a business where we hire someone, we think they're great. We spend a lot of money on training and onboarding them, which is incredibly expensive. You don't realize this until you're on the other side of things. And we've had, had employees, new hires that after a month say, oh, you know, I really just don't want to work Saturdays. So the job's not going to work. And you're like, okay. Um, but you knew the whole time you, you were going to work Saturdays. So, uh, so I think that is, um, that's, something that's a little unforeseen is I think just the employment side of it. And just depending on what your state laws are, it's just, it's, it's a headache to deal, to deal with everything. Do you think that one of the most influential things was having your sister there who has a completely different background from you? She's a little bit more business. Well, she's in listening to the podcast. She has her hands kind of dabbled in a lot of different things, but I'll, completely different experience from you. So she can come in and bring that hospitality side to it. She can bring in a little bit more business knowledge and, or you're bringing in a lot of the medical. Yeah, I think what it is, it's, it's kind of this actually um triangle that I think has made us so successful. So you see my sister and she is, she is personality plus, and I can say this because I'm her sister, but she can be crazy <laughs> sometimes where, I mean, she's like, why is this piece of paper on the floor? You know, I'm like, I don't know, Megan, pick it up, you know? But it's just like, <laughs> if a, if that is on Instagram, the, if the, the office isn't clean, ah! and I'm like, okay, I know, I know, I know. So it's this, this level of passion for hospitality and customer service that's just like insane. So she has that. And then what a lot of our followers or people who listen to podcasts don't see is actually my husband is works with us as well. So he is our CEO, COO, our um chief um, operations officer, and he runs all of the business side of everything. So he actually came from a trucking and logistics background. And so he was helping us with like the books at nighttime when the office first opened. And when we started growing, we had to hire, you know, more like accountants and bookkeepers and all those type of things. And he just decided to come work with us full time. So there is this whole business infrastructure I mean, we have a corporate team, we have a marketing director, our e-commerce director, HR director, uh, operations assistant. We have this whole beast that really runs everything that, that isn't seen as much on social media. So I think, you know, I power the medical side. My husband, Ryan, powers the business side. Megan is that hospitality, personality, Instagram side. And I think that is like this triangle that without one of us, of the three of us, it wouldn't be as successful as it is. Well, that's great. I think it's important too that you are kind of lifting the curtain on the fact that that you do have a team behind you, and it's not you know it's not just you creating the treatment. It's really a group of people that all have a common goal, which is really really cool. Yes, exactly. But I will tell you this: I think sometimes people that are getting into this business kind of jump ahead of that, where they will say, "Oh, I can't. You have a team. I can't do what you do because I don't have a team." Or it's like, yes, but in the very beginning. Megan and I did all of our social media. I did our payroll. I did our taxes, you know, it, and it's something you figured out. And then this is where the systems come in place, you know, okay, we do this and then we can hire, we can sub out one person to do our bookkeeping. And then that's when you create that system. But then I work six days a week to generate enough revenue to cover the cost of a bookkeeper. But then we hire a second injector so I can work five days a week. So you have to figure out that strategic system. I mean, if you want to bang it out six days a week and it's just you at the clinic and you make a lot of money, that's great. But if you do want to have that type of infrastructure, it takes time to build. And I think sometimes what people don't see as well is that, you know, yes, the treatment start was started five years ago, but I had nine years prior to that building my patient base in the local dermatology office where yes, day one, my books were full, but because there was nine years of work before that to get a full schedule. So there's so much time and effort that goes into these very successful injectors that you do see on social media, you see owning practices or multi-clinic locations. It just, it takes, it takes a lot of work, but it's, it's possible. You just have to understand that it just, just doesn't 
happen overnight or there isn't this like magic Botox fairy that like sprinkles success on, onto your plate. Absolutely. It's not like everything came within five years. You had nine years prior to that. So I I think that's absolutely important to highlight. I do kind of want to transition now into talking about how you kind of transitioned into becoming, you know, a national trainer and developing kind of your own training programs and how all of that kind of organically happened. Yeah. So it is, it's networking, you know, it is networking and putting your face out there and so I knew when the training programs were first introduced, this gosh, this was maybe like six or seven years ago when the drug company started having trainers like that were more um, a, a bigger program, I would say. And I was like, I want to do that. So, you know, I was in my Allergan at the time's reps ear, like, I want to be a trainer. How do I be a tra- How do I become a trainer? Let me know. Let me meet the right people. So I was in her ear enough and just showed her, she saw my portfolio, saw what I did. And I was able to become an Allergan trainer first about f- four or five years ago. No, yeah, no, I was at the other office, you know, maybe five or six years ago. And then I became a Galderma trainer because once you're on one company's radar, you get on the other company's radar. And from that, you know, just meeting the right people and networking and making connections and uh, meeting everyone I could at Allergan and Galderma, every rep, every manager, everyone on the corporate team, like anyone I could talk to and get my face in front of at any conference. That's what I did because those connections are really good to have. So you just can kind of meet the right people and have those opportunities presented to you. And even as a trainer, you know, our, our local reps do use us for trainings. But if you make connections with other reps out of state or in different areas, then you're able to train. So I train in Arizona and Nevada. I'm going to Portland in, in a few weeks. So just really networking that way. And so with, since I have those, op- those opportunities to see what it's like to do on-label training, I just see there is such a need for aesthetics to, to have more training. So there's great one-day weekend courses, but nothing is really intended for the beginner in aesthetics. Um, and it's unlike any specialty. So if you say you want to go like an ICU track. I mean, you're going to, if you're a nurse, you're going to get training on the floor through your hospital. They just, that doesn't really happen in the aesthetics world. So you have to create your own training track. The thing about aesthetics training, it's very costly because the products we practice with are very costly. They're thousands and thousands of dollars. And you're also paying for the expertise of someone like myself who's come before you. It's just something where we wanted to combine really good education. I mean, I have, you know, I, I guess I can just say this because it's my practice, but I think my trainers are top notch, or my injectors are just the top notch, most brilliant women. They are just phenomenal. It's really one to have them, and they and they love to teach. I mean, we have a group of injectors that are really great educators, and they wanted to pass that down. So we wanted to combine that level of education along with a mentorship, where it's a very welcoming, supportive way to help you phase into the aesthetics field with all the connections that we have. So it's just an adjunct on to all the other trainings that are available. But I think it is novel because we're really focused on those who are not in the aesthetics industry yet and who want to break into it or maybe working for zero to six months. And that's where our focus is. That's great. So is the training program that you guys do, is it only at one of your locations or do you offer kind of the training at multiple locations? It's only at our Newport Beach office. And what we did, we actually did an expansion of our Newport Beach office. And I believe now it's about 4,000 square feet. And part of that, we built a training center. So we have a very large observation room. We have a whole classroom set up. It's just like a beautiful learning space. And so our other offices, they're all about 40 minutes away from each other. So our Newport Beach office is centrally located. You know, I think people, when they hear Newport, that's a great location to come to, you know, if you want to spend a few days to do some aesthetic training. So it is just at our Newport office. Gotcha. Well, I think that's amazing that you're a resource and you're creating all these resources for, you know, newer injectors and sharing the knowledge that you have. I also think it's, I love that you brought up the fact that when you were looking to become a trainer, it's not like you were waiting for someone to come to you and be like, Oh, Aaron, do you want to be a trainer? No, you were going out there you know, really marketing yourself. So the people that want to eventually become trainers, it's not, these opportunities aren't going to land in your lap. You're going to have to go out and you're going to have to market yourself. And so I think that's important. It is much more competitive nowadays to become a trainer because once you are one, I mean, a space has to open up where they have to expand the program. And it's not just, 
I think sometimes what a little turnoff is when when I, the when I injectors is kind of the whiny like I want to be a trainer. It's like, well, girl, get out there, you know, or guy, get out there and like show your portfolio and attend educational events and support the community. And you know, you have to like show what what you're capable of in order for them to for you to get on their radars. Absolutely. So I do want to touch on one point just because I know that you guys are big into skincare and a lot of your podcast actually talks a lot about skincare. But I think those that are a little bit newer struggle with the conversation with their patients, you know, about bringing in medical grade skincare, putting it with injectables, getting the best results. So I kind of would like you to do kind of a little mock um, skincare consultation with a patient that would be in your chair just so people can listen. Oh yeah, absolutely. I it's so funny working in dermatology, the skin specialty. There, in my practice, there was a lack of focus on medical grade skincare, and so for me, it's like, eh, you're you don't really need it. It's what just use sunscreen. But then when I had my own personal experience with medical grade skincare, oh my god, I used to break out with acne. I'd get perioral dermatitis all the time, and now my skin is just it's great. Like I'm so thankful for all the products. So what I do when educating my patient is that first as an injector, as a medical provider, your first job is to diagnose the patient. That is what we do. And I think that's forgotten about so much in our industry is that you need to have clinical skills to diagnose the patient. When you diagnose their aesthetic needs, then you can prescribe them an aesthetic treatment, whether that's excessive muscle movement, volume loss, uh, skin laxity, you have to identify that first. So when I tell my patients, you know, I ask them, what are your concerns? And we talk about Botox and Dysport and filler. And after we have that whole conversation, I will let them know is that, look, this is just one part of the layers of the skin for your aesthetic needs. So we got to have to talk about your skincare. So I will I usually ask them with like, what are you doing for your skin right now? Do you do peels? Do you do facials? Do you use any, what kind of skincare products do you use? Some people are very versed on medical grade skincare. And if they are use, using medical grade skincare, whether it's a line I carry or not, that's amazing. Like as long as they're using it, you know, based on their needs, you know, again, I'm diagnosing them. Do they have more dry skin, rosacea, melasma, brown spots, wrinkles? Like what are their needs? If they're not using it, then I will do an education. It's like, okay, you know, you're spending all this money. You're spending hundreds or thousands of dollars on injectables. You have to make sure you're taking care of your skin as well. And I will give them kind of the three basics. Like number one, use a good medical grade skincare, a medical grade cleanser. They're, they're, it's a good price point. Your skin will feel so much better. Like at least start with that because you, you you should be washing your face. Like I hope that at the minimum. So a really good cleanser. Also a sunscreen. Like that's non-negotiable. Like if you're not using a sunscreen, you should just like walk back out the door because you're just wasting all <laughs> this money on your injectables. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Our sunscreens, they're great. I mean, we have our our brand and they, they don't smell like sunscreen. They go on very nicely. So that's number two. Number three is, okay, you, I'm sure you have some concerns with your skin. So we need to get a treatment product, a product that's going to treat your issues onto your skin. So whether that's redness, brown spots, dryness, let's get you a treatment. So then you're starting to see some improvement with your skin with that corrective product. Um, and that's what we carry SkinCeuticals products. And I love them. I think they're great because they, they break it down into categories of preventative and corrective products. So, okay, that's your three products, cleanse, a treatment, a corrective product, and your sun and your sunscreen. Okay, and then okay, let's take it one step further. We can talk about vitamin C's, antioxidants. Vitamin C's are very important. They are a higher price point though, so I don't want you just to get a vitamin C and ignore the other three products. So let's get your other three products. Then if you have the budget, we'll add a vitamin C in. And then every time I see my patients for their Botox or Dysport, I'm asking, "How's your skin? Are you having any issues? What products are you using?" And again, it's not to sell our products necessarily. It's just to educate them that. If your if your skin is dull and lackluster, it's your Botox is never going to look as good. So we have to make sure we're focusing on your skin. Now, what I've done at my practice is that we we really compartmentalize all of the departments. So our injectors only inject. Like that is their job to inject only. Then we have another set of medical professionals. They do all the devices that we have. So they do um, our laser, our BBL laser. They do microneedling. They do PRFM. They do our B12 shots, cortisone shots. So that is another component of it. And so what we try to do is that those are our skincare experts, our skincare nurses. So they we set up skincare consultations so that medical provider can sit down with the patient, have enough time, really focus on it, 
Because if you're getting all the information about Botox and filler and injectables and skincare on top of it, it's a little bit overwhelming. So we do try to funnel that to our skincare nurses and then, but also we have our estheticians as well. So we try to lean while the injectors do a light education on it. We try to make a more thorough education with another department in the practice. I love the way that you've structured that. I think that that's great. Again, it's not something that every injector can immediately start doing and hiring and leaning on a bunch of different people, but I love the way that you touched on it. And then I love the way that your clinic is set up. I think that that's a a very unique way of doing it. Yes. Well, thank you. I think just it's an in and out model. You know, you, we have our specialties and, you know, I just did, I trained at a practice this morning, very lovely practice, great practice, but they had probably 12 devices, two practitioners. So those practitioners doing all the devices, all the injectables, And that's really difficult to become extremely proficient on any one thing when you're doing so many different things. So especially getting into injectables, don't feel like, or aesthetics, don't feel like you have to do everything. Find one thing that's your niche, and then you can always grow from there. So you've already given amazing advice. I do (laughs) want to give you this opportunity to, if you haven't said anything for, you know, the aspiring or maybe the new injector that's only been injecting one to three years, what kind of last pearls would you like to leave for those injectors? So you, as a new injector, you have to soak up every educational opportunity that is out there. There's plenty of free education that is out there. I mean, every single lunch break, you should be reading articles. You should be watching training videos. You should be reading journals. You you should be um, subscribing to Patreon that really great injectors have. You need to, I mean, it should never end. I mean, even now, I mean, that's, education is such a pillar in my office that we have continuing education all the time. But as a beginner, if you are not educating yourself all day, every day, then you're doing yourself a disservice. Aesthetics is not a side gig. It's not something that you just do one Saturday a month or you pick up on the weekends or you do it once a week. I mean, you can go down to once a week over time, but if you want to be a really good aesthetic provider, you have to do it every day all the time. Like you would never just say like, oh, I'm going to go into like cardiology one day a week. I'm just going to learn that. Like it's not, aesthetics is way more complicated than you think. So you really just need to dive into it. It is scary and nerve wracking and it's medicine in a totally different way where you're having to deal with patient personalities a little bit differently, talking about budgets. So it is, you have to have a little bit of um, like a backbone. You have to protect yourself a little bit where you have to like dominate the room. People can walk all over you in aesthetics like patients can. And just remember that you're the medical provider. So you have to, you prescribe them an appropriate treatment plan and you should not let it change based on, you know, what their desires are or budget needs or what they recommend the units they should get. Like you need to lead, lead the way, I would say. And yeah, just, it's really fun, but it takes a few years to feel really comfortable at it. And even still, I mean, there's areas I treat or patients that, you know, kind of, you know, make me a little stressed out. So it never fully goes away, but it's, it's fun once you like really, really dive into it. And then I have one pearl for experienced injectors or injectors that already have their practice. I see this all the time and it just kind of blows my mind that this is how most offices operate. If you are an aesthetic provider and you have a decent patient load, you should have a medical assistant. Like there is no other specialty out there that doesn't operate without a medical assistant. Me personally, I I will not work without two medical assistants at a time. It's just so much better for your patient. It's better continuity of care. Um, It's better for the provider. I mean, you see one extra patient a day and that will pay for their daily salary of your medical assistant. And it makes your life so much easier. So it is very rare, very, very rare that I train a practice that has works with medical assistants. Like they are my, like they, I could not live without them. And that's something at my, the other, when we first opened the treatment, I didn't have a medical assistant for about six months and it was very rough and very stressful. But the moment we could afford one, I added one on. So I would recommend everybody work with a medical assistant. Like it is, it will change your life. Great advice. So Aaron, where can they find you on social media? Where can they find training opportunities? And then where can they find your clinics? Yes. So I am Aaron Jensen on Instagram, Aaron Jensen underscore PA and J E N S E N. We have at through thick and skin podcast on Instagram. 
that is our, our name on our podcast is through thick and skin. Um, our, our office name is at the treatment and we have all our different locations. We have our main look our first location, Claremont. We have Redlands. We have Newport beach. We're opening San Clemente in April, all in Southern California. And then we are opening another state. I will announce that I think in two weeks, our fifth location. And I am a trainer for Allergan and Galderma. So if you are interested in having me come, in, come to your practice and train you, talk to your rep, talk to your BDM, and you can request me and I can come and see you and train you on behalf of the drug company's dime. So I would love <laughs> to do that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Erin, for taking the time to record with me today. Thank you, Kiki. This was so amazing. I really appreciate what you're doing for the aesthetic space. Um, thank you so much. This was really fun. Thank you again to Erin for coming on Aesthetic Chat with Kiki. I have a few of you that have reached out and wanted me to interview some more PAs. So Erin is a great resource. She has been doing this a long time. Use her. Go check out her locations in California. Also, go listen to her and Megan's podcast uh, through Thick and Skin. Again, I binged kind of all the episodes before recording with her, and they are very entertaining, very informative, and yeah, just super great. So go listen to their podcast. To hear updates on my podcast, follow the podcast Instagram at aesthetic.chatwithkiki. You can find my aesthetic Instagram, which is at aestheticnurse.kiki. My website, aestheticnursekiki.com. You can listen to the podcast. You can find fun apparel. And then you can also see upcoming events. You can find the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and now YouTube at Aesthetic Nurse Kiki is the channel for YouTube. Until next time, beauties. Bye.